Good morning, everybody. So some of you may know and some of you might not that um, uh, before I started the Farmer Veteran Coalition, um, in my, I had a long career in vegetable production. And so it's a real uh, passion of mine. Um, I actually went into farming as a uh, first generation farmer and uh, with no land, no money and no education and uh, desire to farm and uh, it kind of worked out for me. Um, uh, I went to work in 1970 in a, uh, uh, a crew harvesting pimento peppers for a farmer that was had a contract with Nabisco and about a week into it, I think I was 21 or 22 years old, and a week into it, um, the farmer got sick and uh, the son came out and said, hey, you, can you run this harvest? And I said, well, well, okay. And uh, the rest was history. By the time my career, my career was done, I had uh, ended up managing not as an, a couple of them, the first couple as an owner. And then in uh, 1990, um, after losing uh, everything, the second time when a well went dry on my uh, on a farm I was managing outside of the, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, later recognized as a pioneer for the locavore movement, which I didn't even know there was such a thing at the time. Um, I got a phone call uh, from uh, one of my buyers saying, there's this young man that's going to start the first organic farm in Salinas Valley, and he'd like to know if you'd be interested in, in uh, running it for him because he doesn't know how to farm and you do. And he has money and an idea and a market and uh, he wants to know. This was, so this was my farm from the 1980s. So I ended up going on to Salinas, long story short, uh, I got to build three of the largest organic vegetable operations in the country and grow $250 million worth of organic food. And uh, I call FEC my seventh farm. So this was my because now I farm farmers and so help you all. So this is a real passion for me. Uh, I'm gonna do a few slides about myself. Then I'm gonna quickly introduce the, the, the three wonderful panelists who I've gotten to meet over the years. Um, and then um, they're going to get up, introduce themselves, and then I'm gonna have a couple questions for them. And then you get to answer some questions. So this is uh, in the 90s. I pioneered the production of organic uh, salad production. That's what the uh, farm I went to manage uh, wanted to grow. And we took it, we I took it from a couple hundred thousand dollars in 1990 to $25 million company in 95. In 96, I went on and continued to produce for that company and the two other, uh, uh, all the two other large um, organic salad companies, and so there was a period of about a year where I was producing 90% of the um, organic salad in the United States. This is a field of arugula near the Mexican border. This is, represents a couple days of arugula harvest at that time in my, uh, my career. This is, uh, I think a year or so later, I went down and started the, uh, the uh, the one of the first, one of the two started simultaneously uh, organic uh, tomato operations in the Sinaloa Valley, Mexico, which at the at to this date is one of the largest uh, uh, tomato production areas for the U.S. market in uh, North America and uh, the biggest vegetable valley in in Mexico. So this is a real pioneering indoor tomato production at the time. That's me in a field of peas. Later on in Baja, California, peas were actually not one of our major crops, but uh, these are snap peas, and uh, we grew, we would pack about 5,000 boxes of snap peas a week, uh, grown organically. They're just a 10-pound box. We do a couple thousand snow peas and, uh, and about 2,000 English peas, which are in a 26-pound box. So peas were really wonderful to grow because they're a legume. They're great for the soil. They're a great rotation, and uh, they're wonderful to eat raw. I ate them 
my weight in uh, snap peas every day, and uh, um, that they were in production. I'm probably out here grazing at the time, and uh, um, and they were a great seasonal rotation with the tomatoes we did. And uh, one of the things I got to do my last couple years in Mexico was uh, learn indoor tomato production. So this is uh, my last couple years uh, farming in Mexico. We did 30 acres of indoor organic tomatoes planted in the soil and uh, with large tomatoes. We also did many acres of, uh, I personally managed 700 acres of outdoor cherry tomatoes on poles and uh, we produced um, a half a million clamshells of organic cherry tomatoes a week. And uh, we also produced a semi-load of organic basil a day. So um, that was my career. Now I get to introduce these three wonderful veterans. So my real passion about FEC, uh, I'll give you a little uh, secret that the um, uh, FEC at my request has started an executive search um, and hired the, the uh, largest uh, executive search team, the leading executive search team in the country to find a replacement for me as director so I can continue to work for FEC in the capacity of chief agricultural advisor because what I really want to do is, is help these guys and help you all uh, learn um, and become successful vegetable product, uh, producers. Don't ask me about cows. When I started the uh, Farmer Veteran Fellowship Fund, the first veteran that asked for some five heifers, and I had to turn to somebody and ask what a heifer was. And so, uh, uh, sorry to, uh, on that end, but uh, I've learned a lot more since then. But vegetables is, is my passion, and uh, it's been my career, and it's been something that I was really lucky to, um, um, luck, luck, you know, a lot of luck brought me to the right places. I was kind of like a force Gump in the vegetable world. <laughs> so uh, our three panelists, really quick. Uh, closest to me is uh, Elaine Vanderveer. Uh, Elaine runs, uh, raises alpacas and cut flowers in Washington State. She's here with her husband, Mike. They both served. Uh, I got to meet Elaine some years ago in Washington, D.C. when we kind of stormed the Capitol and introduced them to uh, this wonderful movement about farmer veterans and uh, been watching her career grow and really literally blossom as she added this gorgeous aspect of flowers. And I've just been a big fan of following, following her career on social media and thinking how beautiful. Next to her is uh, Endeavor Shen. And Endeavor Shen has been to his operation, which is just spectacular. He has two kind of businesses. One does orchids, uh, and the other is, is hydroponic uh, whole lettuces. They're both just beautiful. I mean, the real pay in farming is, is not monetary. I always say it's just to be around that beauty all the time. And uh, finally, Robert Eversole. I met Robert at our panel in, um, he, he was on our uh, statewide uh, conference for the Farmer Veteran Coalition in Kentucky last year. And uh, he's, uh, Robert raises salad greens and cherry tomatoes. And I thought, hmm, I think I've, maybe I could be some help someday, you know, but he's been doing it on his own and uh, uh, extremely successfully. And uh, so he's going to get to talk a little bit about that. And so I'm going to let them each, um, I guess you got to come up here because this is the mic unless it moves, but um, um, let you, and you do your own PowerPoint things. And I think I got Endeavor first and then Elaine and then Robert. So I'm going to let them come up once, one by one and introduce themselves and their farms. And then I'm going to ask them some questions. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Endeavor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of being up here. Truly is a blessing to be able to stand here. Um, so I, I'm going to go over a little of my history really quick. 
So our farm is called Sundial Farm. I also own an uh, orchid nursery. It's called South Coast Orchids. Uh, Navy veteran, um, after I got out, I did 10 years in accounting. Um, did in cost accounting um, in private and public sectors, and then also was a realtor. Uh, this is my little career path and really quickly go over. Um, what I'm trying to do is go over what my farm does and then try to give you guys time for questions. So I, I think it's better to work it out this way. Um, so this is how I got started. I, mean, I, ran at a, I went to a night school for hydroponic, and then uh, after the night school, I just went and found the greenhouse, and then we started cleaning it up, building a hydroponic uh, NFT channels like this. So we started with the micro loans uh, from the USDA. Um, we just set up regular tables. We tested out the basils, and there's one morning that I, I went to the farm. Um, this is there's really no any walls around the greenhouse, and my tank froze, and my basil is still alive. So. At that point, I'm like, well, there might be something. So I, I uh, started growing and then able to sell to a pesto maker. And they were making a lot of pesto out of it. So that's how I, about this time, I was working actually two other jobs. Uh, I was doing full-time accounting and also doing real estate and then doing this basil. I did this for about a year uh, before I really made the decision to jump in and uh, start farming. This is some of the basil picture. These are all NFT channels. And this is what happened when I started farming. <laughs> so the day uh, we closed, uh, the day of my farewell from my accounting job, um, somebody rear-ended me and totaled my car. Um, that's when I really, uh, first got into farming. We actually just finished purchasing the, the whole property. Uh, and you know, this is what happened. I learned that what things are bad, when things are bad, is not necessarily bad. When things are good, is not necessarily good. Um, what happened is that after the, the accident, my old company literally sell me this for three thousand dollars and really helped me out because now I can transport orchids instead of Honda Accord. I couldn't do anything like that. So it is a huge blessing to have. And now this is the hydroponic production. We grow about, uh, we are in 16,000 square foot of hydroponic greenhouse. Uh, we grow a lot of leafy greens, uh, red salanova, mir, butter lettuce, kale, tatsoi. We all try to get a niche, so we kind of, you know, sometimes grow something called wasabi arugula that this little thing tastes like wasabi. Yeah. Nice. yeah so you always try to find that special niche and so forth. This is my family, is my wife and two kids, and when we really first started a farm. You got one more now. Yes, I, three months ago, I had one more. <laughs> so they're 11, eight, and uh, three months old right now, yeah. So ho hopefully that's my uh, future staff right there. <laughs> that, that little girl, yeah, she controls all of us. She's, uh, she's, she's literally at accounting. <laughs> and this is my kids helping out at the farm. And this is what we do. Uh, we sell directly to a school district of 28 schools, and we're able to get connected. Um, so we actually give school tours to our, uh, the children and you know, showing them around. We grow something called Sorrel and uh, Mustard Green. I tell them Sorrel tastes like uh, Sour Patch, the best Sour Patch you ever have, and then the kids just gobble it up. And, and I'm like, who want to try the Fireball? And I give them Mustard Green, and they all choke and spit it out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love it. It's entertainment for me. And <laughs> but you know, we took two channels. We had the kids harvest. It's just a beautiful thing to see them actually going through this process. I mean, down in California, you can tell them to go find a salsa tree, and they will try to find one. Yeah. So, and this is on the kids, a little car appreciation. You know, showing them the farm. This is something we do um, with our. Uh, Restaurant customers, uh, sometimes we'll, uh, we'll print out a certificate and we'll give it to them. Thank you for supporting veterans. We'll make sure the Homegrown by Hero logo is on there. I mean, really, that Homegrown by Hero logo, it, it is, it's worth a million dollars. <laughs> Use it to your advantage. It is uh, people's support. No matter what your story is, what your background in the military is, 
um, that logo really helps out and then and start conversation with other uh, folks. And then people do appreciate. And they always say thank you for your service and then they always want to understand your story, your background. So it's good to actually put this certificate out into the restaurant and that helps the marketing campaign on both sides. This is my orchid operation. Uh, we grow 50,000 orchid in our 22,000 square foot greenhouse. Um, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. and we'll make the slides okay. So uh, in the orchid operation, we have about 50,000 orchids. Uh, we sell about 10,000 orchids a month. Uh, we rotate them like five month cycle. From the time the orchid is starting to the bloom cycle, it, it takes four years. And then I do not grow them for four years. Uh, I actually get the plants from Taiwan. They're three, three years and a half month, uh, three years and six months. And then we bloom them out here in our orchid house for another six months to get ready for sale. Um, as you guys know, in orchids, you know, you, you see orchids 20, 30, 40 bucks, but as a farmer, you're not getting that kind of pricing. Yeah. So we know as a producer, you, you got to figure out a value added or you got to go for quality. So our orchids, uh, a lot of time we sell to people like Bellagio Las Vegas. Uh, some of our florists uh, does the Grammy Awards that we, they use our orchids on. So again, I had to instill quality in everything we do. I understand in this room, everybody can do quality and everybody cares about their product. So there's not a problem in that. It's just able to sell your story and then sell your marketing, how you want to present yourself. So this is my, I have a staff of uh, 11 people, including my wife, and uh, we all have, on, we are on payroll. There's no point in doing this if, again, if you can't make money, um, you can't go on, you can't do the stuff that you really truly want to do. So uh, for the last, I started this business three years ago. For the last three years, we're able to do uh, pretty good sales uh, for the orchid and the farm. We do about 1.2 million in sales. And this is some of the stuff that uh, I, I, I was able to get in one of the grocery stores a little higher end. Uh, they were able to do right stories. They put the posting right on top of the vegetable or right on top of the orchids. Um, so it, it's really helped you get your name out there. And this is some of the orchid flowers that we grow. It's all Philanopsis orchids, just different colors. And this is my son. It's always good to help out. He, we did, uh, when there was a hurricane, we did like a fundraising. So we were donating all our money that we made for that day. And, you know, just teaching your kids and, you know, t to give back. And, and he's just being funny. And uh, I didn't teach him that salute, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I know this looks very, very simple. But I'm telling you, I, my investor, their second largest lock company in the world, I mean, in the United States, he started as a locksmith. Okay, and then I have an investor that makes all your shoes for Nike. They are very cash wealthy, and this is what they tell me. When you go into business and you do your perfect calculation, your business plan, and everything you thought of is going to be wrong. I have a 10 years in accounting. I did cost accounting. I'm still wrong. Okay, so whatever you do at your final number, make sure you times that by 60%. That's how much you're truly going to make. And that number is a magical number. It works every time. I went into this business three years ago thinking I would make X amount. No. <laughs> that number hit the spot at the end of that year. Uh, when it's bad, when your employee is telling you something is wrong, don't think it's just X. Do that times 1.4. That's how bad it is. So this, this two number, I, I feel like, please write it down. It is your magical number. It, is, it falls into that number every time. Anybody has a question on farming or you know, business uh, plans or anything, that's my cell phone. You can feel free to call, text, anything. That's a direct line to me. There's no please hold. <laughs> OK, and that's it. Thank you.
Well, I'm Elaine Vandiver. Uh, I have old homestead alpacas. We are in Walla Walla. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, Elaine Vandiver. I have uh, old homestead alpacas. We are in Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, that's the state. Um, and so I. I served three years in the Army. I was with the 864th Combat Engineer Battalion, very beginning of the Iraq War. Came home, my husband and I moved to Walla Walla, and after a traditional family didn't work for us, we looked for kind of something new to do, a new project. So um, for us, that was finding a little acreage and a little bit of space to find what was next. And for us, what we found was alpacas. <laughs> so um, we started our herd in 2015. And it was really, there was really no plan. It was just space and some really adorable critters, as you can see. Um, but once we had them, I learned, well, what do you do with them? Um, well, we raise them for fiber. That's what we do with them. Um, and so we got a few more because they are very efficient eaters. And once I got my first fiber harvest back in 2016, so it was a full year to grow the, the fiber, I had it made into some knitting yarns, which were beautiful. I had a white, a brown, and like a light fawn. And then I thought, well, how do you get blue? How do you get red? Well, you have to dye the fiber to get those colors. And I thought, well, can I do something naturally? So I learned about natural dyeing. And there's actually, that's how we used to dye our clothes before when we were quite old, you know, like back in the day, you used what you had, which were plants and flowers and different things from the native environment to get color. So I learned a lot of those um, heirloom dye plants grow perfectly well in the Walla Walla Valley. So I started dabbling with that and I started growing a little bit of dye plants and experimenting and dyeing our harvest each year. And we did that for a couple years. At the time, I still worked for the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, full time, as did my husband, um, running the herd and the farm and learning literally as we went. Um, and so, you know, once you start farming, I don't know if anybody else is still working an off farm job, but you kind of have to split yourself in half to get things to work. Um, and leaving the farm every day was getting harder and harder to do. There's always projects to do. And then for me, it was the personal, not being in the cubicle all day. I mean, it was great, don't get me wrong. I, working for the Corps of Engineers was wonderful. It actually bootstrapped our farm. Um, but more and more, I was pulled, you know, it's like, well, I'm gonna have Korea born. I need to be there for that. And, you know, there's only so much you can do when you're giving literally your eight best hours of the day to somebody else. So I kept thinking, well, how, how can I make this work? Because when it takes a year to grow the fiber, and it takes generally another year after the fiber is shorn to produce something, be it yarn or a scarf, two years is a long leverage, uh, even if you're working full time. Um, so I thought, well, what, what else can I do? Um, Those are some dye plants for you. Um, so I kind of got to thinking, well, what else can I do? Well, one year, my neighbor asked me to help him across the street. They, they grow melons, watermelons and cantaloupes. So I went to market with him one, one day, and it was fantastic. We pull up with a, four bins of melons. People flock to you. They're five bucks each. It, you're just, I mean, like, you're making money. I, it, I didn't have that experience with alpaca fiber. It took so long to get it, and it was a very niche product and here's like turning over like making money and so I thought well this is really kind of neat you know what what can I turn more regularly than than fiber um, well I'm already growing flowers so I thought well what if I grew some cut flowers and so that's kind of what I did um, well, this is some of our product that's been dyed naturally. I guess I could elaborate a little bit. Um, the hand on the left-hand side, that's my first harvest of matter root, uh, Rubia tinctorum. It takes three years to grow that crop to get enough pigment in the root to make a beautiful red color as well as pink. Um, 
This is uh, the hats and gloves on top. That's this year's 2019 harvest. I actually bought it, brought it to market in 17 months, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, and all the natural colors, those are all safe colors that I grew. Um, and then we do a line of knitting yarns that our local yarn store carries for us. Um, yeah, and then so this first picture with the barn was my very first can I really do cut flowers? Because it's totally different. I, you know, when you're harvesting for dye plants, I'm literally plucking the blossoms off and throwing them in a Ziploc and freezing them or drying them. It's quite different when you want a fresh bouquet to last. So I did a couple roses, zinnias. You'll probably see in the front a lot of weeds as well, um, but a lot of zinnias uh, just to cut to see, is this something I like? Can I really do this? And it, you know, you're working on vase life and stem length and you know all kinds of things. And so it turned out I did like it. And I'd visited the farmer's market a few times to realize that there was room in, in the market for me. Um, so in 2018, the Corps let me go down to part-time. And I went to market that very first year selling cut flowers from about June to September. Um, and then this year was my first year, left the cubicle entirely, um, selling flowers at market from May through October. Um, with May and from May as well as September and October, I, I present the fiber there as well, because it's usually cool enough where people are interested to buy. Um, so I have a little farm stand that I pull with my minivan. It's a pretty nice little deal. And I think that, that might be my last picture, but that was just kind of like a brief overview. So uh, alpacas and cut flowers in Walla Walla. Hello, my name is Robert, and I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. Um, I'm a wholesale farmer, primarily vegetables, as Michael said, salad greens and cherry tomatoes. My path in farming was kind of unconventional. Started out 2003 when I joined the military at 17 years old just to escape eastern Kentucky. Uh, it was my primary motive for leaving. And a uh, joke was on me, I joined the Navy, but being a fleet Marine Force medic, uh, I was stationed with the Marine Corps my entire career. Um, my last year, I decided, what's, what's next? Uh, I needed to know. I wanted to do something else. I'm always chasing that next thing. So I thought, well, being a medic, next thing, be a physician. So I was taking a couple of night classes, finished up my um, obligation, got out, <clears throat> went to college, and quickly learned, I don't really want to treat disease. I wanted to stop it from happening to begin with. Uh, but sitting in nutrition classes and hearing people bark at you, do this, do that, do that, I realized I wasn't going to be trying to bark at Kentuckians to eat healthier. I mean, Hippocrates is, did it thousands of years ago, and here we are in Kentucky, still the unhealthiest state in the nation. Uh, so I wasn't going to do that. So I thought, I don't really know what to do. So by an off chance, I took this little one credit hour class out of curiosity at night called Is Inequality Making Us Sick? And it really opened my eyes to like how food can affect the longevity and disease prevalence within a specific population. And I thought, well, I don't really know where to go from here. Is it public policy in food? What is it? Um, but I knew I was not going to continue in college until I figured out what it was. I wasn't going to waste my money or time. So I decided to start looking for work in the food industry. I'd figure out what it was. I'd know it when I found it. Uh, but it was the height of the recession, 2009, 2010. There was no work anywhere. So I was relegated to doing what I knew, and I managed a toxicology lab. But I was uh, talking to my grandmother, I was visiting with her, and she had all of her seed catalogs laid out. And you know, I, Growing up, we always raised our own food, put our food up for winter. And it kind of was a little nostalgic for me. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to do that too. So planted a little quarter acre garden and uh, had way more than what we could do, we could use. Didn't have time to put it up because I was working full time, so we gave it away to some friends at work. I remember somebody said, hey, have you ever heard of a CSA? I was like, CSA, CSA, what is that, some sort of new drug from China? 
I have no clue. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I went on down to the public library, checked out some books, and the more I read, the more I wanted to read, and the more I wanted to read, I just decided to do it. So we picked five of our closest friends to start a CSA that year with our extra produce. Year after year, we grew, and we decided that uh, we were going to keep focusing on the CSA program. But where do you take it next? More members? That wasn't really what I wanted to do. So we started a fully customizable CSA. Take what you need, take what you want. Uh, it was kind of revolutionary at the time. There was no food subscription services. You know, this is back in 2013, 14. Uh, there was only a handful of farms doing it. There were no software platforms like Harvey or Small Farm Central to help you. We just spent all winter on an off-the-shelf website on the internet building this ourselves, trying to do it. And it was fun. It got my creativity out. I was able to do something else. We wound up growing over 60 different crops for 60 CSA members over a season of like 40 weeks. It was a lot of fun. But I knew I wanted to quit my job. I knew this is what I wanted to do full time at this point. But I needed some financial viability to make sure that if I had a bad year in vegetables, what was I going to do? I did not want to have to go back to work. So we added 150 head of Black Angus cattle, and we run a cow-calf operation on the rest of our land. We have 505 acres, of which we, uh, this year we did about 10 acres in produce. The rest is for fully grass-fed cattle, no grain. Uh, we, it's hay and grass only. So the next logical step was we needed to do something else, because I'm always looking for what's next. Uh, so we started dabbling into the wholesale market a little bit, and I quickly realized uh, this, is, this is something I think I could do. But we wanted to flesh it out, so we did some farmer's markets. I quickly realized that's my own personal hell. If, you know, if I have to go downstairs at the end of this, I'll be running a farmer's market the rest of eternity. It was not a fit for me. <laughs> it was not a fit. Um, so I decided, Last year, we're going to shelf the CSA program for a little while. Uh, it was becoming too much to focus on 60 crops, 60 members, keeping everybody happy, and the wholesale industry, which is very fastidious. They are picky, and their standards are, uh, quite honestly, ridiculous to some degree. But that part intrigued me. I love the challenge of them always wanting more, more, more attention to detail. You know, that's what got me in the military to begin with. So it, it was a good fit. So we started working with arguably the largest food service provider in the world, Aramark, last year. And uh, we, you know, a big portion here, it comes back to uh, that desire to stop disease before it starts. And I thought, well, maybe this is it. Um, get to the kids before they're old enough that they're set in their ways, you know. Um, so I thought, well, that's just college. So we decided to bring in a whole public school system, an entire county, nine schools, from preschool to high school. So I thought, wow, if I do this long enough, I could, this kid could be eating my cherry tomatoes and salad greens from preschool, the first time they ever leave home, to college, the very last time they leave home. I thought, if all they've ever had is my stuff or local food, that's all they're ever going to want, just like me as an adult now. That's the same way I grew up. So it really kind of rounded it out for me. And it kind of solidified the path that we were going to take. So we currently work with the University of Kentucky. This is all through Aramark. The University of Kentucky, University of Louisville, EKU, Eastern Kentucky University just signed on. We've done some Western Kentucky University, Moorhead State, um, a lot of stuff in Cincinnati. We're in Lexington, Kentucky, so we're very central. We service Cincinnati, Louisville, and Lexington, three very large cities. Um, So two crops, that's all we wanted to focus on. We wanted to master two crops first. So one of those was salad greens. It made the most sense. Salad greens are arguably, by the time you get them, junk a lot of times. I'm sure all of you have bought a bag of salad mix at the store, went to make a salad three days later, and it's nothing but slime in the bottom of the fridge. So, and that's because, you know, they're growing in California and Arizona. It has to be harvested, washed, packed, microbiological testing. That's three or four days, and then shipped to the distribution center, from distribution center to the service center, from service center to the end customer, and then you get it and either eat it then or take it home. And so at this point, it's pretty old. So, and food waste is a very big thing these days, so it makes sense. I can say this product's good for two to three weeks from the time you get it. There's no food waste. It's an easy sell. So we focused on baby kale, 
uh, baby romaine, uh, a lot of spring mix, and then my bread and butter where I can let my creativity shine up in the corners or signature mix. And that's something that I do. It changes as the season goes on. It is the uh, best tasting, best looking crops of that week that I harvest. Uh, so if we have a flea beetle issue or something like that, I can just cut a crop out and I still have a product to sell regardless of what's happening in the field. Some weeks it may be just spring mix. Some weeks, like in this picture, this is early spring. This is spring mix, a little baby kale, some spinach, some mizuna. And it also lets you use that creativity portion because there's not a lot of room for creativity in wholesale. They want what they want. But this allows me to grow some of those bespoke seeds that come out that are brand new and have a place to offload those without having to bring in an entirely new marketing channel, which I don't want to do so that I can focus on developing my crops within the wholesale market. The big focus that we're doing now, for the, uh, the big project is season extension. We want our product in the kitchen for as long as possible. We don't want to ever leave the kitchen. However, we do grow in a season that experiences pretty harsh winters. We've already had a 12 degree night in early November. Um, so here you can see we focus on using low energy, no cost sort of inputs. I'm not really big on using lights, heat, things like that. Uh, it, I think it can be done without it. So here you'll see caterpillar tunnels, which I love because they're low cost. If they come down in a storm, you can have them back up in half an hour. If you have disease pressure or something going on with your soil, you need to take some time off, get some cover crops in there. You can just move it in a couple hours. Also focus on proper variety selection, something that can withstand the freeze. This picture is from January 25th. It's been frozen many times in the open field. It's a baby romaine mix, three color variety, red, green, speckled. Uh, so we pay careful attention to trialing different varieties to figure out what works for us. And then my biggest passion really is seed saving, getting uh, the crop acclimated to my farm specifically. And this is a baby kale crop, which I basically just planted in the open field. What survived, survived. And I only take the seed from the surviving crop. So my end goal being a baby kill that I can plant and harvest from throughout the winter without any sort of uh, outside inputs like heat, electric, things like that. And lastly, cherry tomatoes. Um, we grow a lot of cherry tomatoes. We focus on a four color mix. We do sell them individually, but we do red, yellow, pink, and a chocolate or black. Um, in terms of volumes, this year we did a little over 10,000 pounds of salad greens and a little over 8,000 pounds of cherry tomatoes. And really our, our big goal here though is we have a vision to set an example for the next generation, specifically not just farmers but the next generation, everyone, that farming can repair our damaged ecosystem if it's done right if you take care of your land. It can also be profitable. A lot of people don't think farmers are profitable, so it can be profitable. It can empower us, but most importantly, it, it can provide us a sense of purpose. That's it, thank you. Not sure how we're going to do. Maybe this. You hear me, but is this, is this portable for them? Okay. I mean, I, I can hand it because I'm going to ask some questions. So what I'm going to do is going to ask uh, two questions of the panelists and uh, let them each answer this, and then um, try to leave some time for your questions. And uh, so basically. Um, last few years, I've had, I've had a chance to give a couple uh, presentations. Um, I actually go down to a, a training farm in Salinas, and uh, we've done it there, and uh, where they take ex-farm workers and, and who want to become farmers themselves. So I've done the class in uh, Spanish about as much as I've done it in English, but it's basically uh, my 
my way I look at uh, vegetable production. And what I teach is that you need to go into vegetable and, and flour being the same way. That's why I put them together because they're basically uh, uh, um, grown with the same concepts. And I teach the, the two concepts that, that I encourage people to study is, um, is yield, which is how much you produce per area. And what can you do to increase that? You know, how many plantings can you, when we did the baby salads, we would get many, many plantings in the open field per year, but we also study plant population and the density of plants and, and uh, how quickly you can turn over one, you know, how, how much uh, reduce the downtime between one planting and the next time, I call that turnaround time. So we talk about how to increase yield and then we also talk about productivity and productivity is how much you produce per time. So a real simple thing is how many hours it takes to, uh, to harvest your crop or to harvest, a, how much time it takes to harvest a box of salad greens or a bouquet of lettuce or um, you know, the hydroponic lettuce. And, and as you get going, you really want to study those two concepts and, and really, really get, make those become what numbers that you really understand. And as you, most of the decisions you make going forward, and I could see it in, uh, Robert when he went from, oh, you know, the, at the CSA, I might be able to make a lot of money doing this. Uh, get high price, but um, you know I have to spend a lot of time marketing it, and also the complexity of growing sixty different things. I'm not going to be as equally as efficient, and so that's your productivity. And so what you really need to know is you're balancing every decision you then make as a farmer. You're weighing yield versus productivity. And where does that right balance for me in these two things? So the first thing, I'm gonna ask two questions. I'm gonna ask each of these uh, wonderful, wonderful panelists to uh, first answer what they do, uh, what, is, what, what they do to improve yield and to think about yield on their farm. And then the second question, we're gonna ask them what they do about productivity, and then we're gonna open it up to you guys. So this is yield. Well, for me, yield, um that was the actual diversification uh, into cut flowers because with the fiber, I'm, I'm limited to a one harvest a year. Shearing them twice does not work. You don't get, you don't get an additional length. Um, so for me to increase yield, like the entire yield of my whole farm was to e expand into another product, which was cut flowers. Um, but I also did do some, I don't want to say, from yield, like I found more products as well for the fiber. So I first started with knitting yarns, very, very small market of folks that knit and crochet still. Um, then I expanded to garments, which was wonderful. But in order to get even a knitting yarn or a fiber for the garment, it's a very particular place on the animal, and that's limited again to one year. Um, I was using the auxiliary cuts of fiber for some actually very high margin products. Um, for instance, using things that just were not cost effective to put into yarn, I make dryer balls, because um, everybody does dry clothes, whether they crochet or want a very high-end scarf, they do dry their clothes, and a lot of people don't want to rely on dryer sheets. So I expanded to offer, to, that, to me that's a yield thing because it's like I have to do more with what, what I have. And I guess to that end, um, I even use the scrap fiber that I can't put into yarn to store my dahlia tubers. It provides fantastic insulation, it's a natural product. When I'm done with it at the end of the year, I can toss it into the compost pile which gives a nice little bit of structure to the soil and gives it a place to go. Um, and then I've been using the alpaca manure. Um, alpacas are fantastic, they're beautiful little critters, but they're also very intelligent. They use communal dung piles, so they make it super convenient to go get from the field. A and the NPK ratio on their manure is such that it doesn't require the composting. You can, you can use it right away. You can certainly compost it, which we do 
in the winter because it's easier. Um, but I take it fresh, and I that's I exclusively amend my cut flower garden with the alpaca manure. So for me, that was um, the productivity on the the fiber side, and on the flower side to increase yield. Um, huge proponent of succession planting because I am a one woman show. My husband does help, but it's just me. So every transplant gets sown by me, planted by me, and harvested by me. So I have to know, you know, I, I don't want to plant it all at the same time because that hurts. Um, and I also don't want to have to harvest it all at the same time because there's, I have to harvest in the morning before it gets hot. Um, and so there's only so many hours to harvest. So staggered plantings um, succession as well as we I've been learning a little bit on ex season extension I use caterpillar tunnels um, to kind of bring me further into you know October with some mums and some hardy annuals so that I can still offer some bouquets so. Um. so um I'm in California so the land uh, there's very, very expensive. Uh, four acre land I'm looking at is about 900 grand. Um, so I had to make sure that I use the proper spacing and so forth. So for me, it's understanding my number inside a greenhouse. So I have a 16,000 square foot. Each table put, um, I can plant 720 lettuce or leafy greens. Um, so f what we do is I understand my numbers. Number is very important. You got to know how, how, how much you're having or uh, harvestable. So I, pan, I plant 3,888 seedings every week. I can harvest, um, you know, we divide our greenhouses evenly, so from seeding to harvest is exactly eight weeks. Everything is timed properly. Every table we put on, we have the seeding days. We know exactly when we're harvesting it. Um, in terms of yield that uh, we're trying to increase, the, the very uh, important part is actually have a strong, strong germination. If you have a very good germination, really uh, um, good roots, it will create a, actually a, a quicker turnaround time. Um, for us, we are in the greenhouse, so we do have water wall, we do have fans to cool down the, uh, in the summertime. And growing lettuce in San Diego in the winter is, is the best time ever. I mean, fan barely turns on and everything looks beautiful. Um, and with our channels, they're like a gutter. Um, so before we had 16, cha uh, 16 holes in one channels. Now we, you know, we, we are able to uh, actually drill two more holes in there to have the right spacing. So you see that that's increased. Um, what I found out is really interesting that when I first started, the, the greenhouse is empty. So I have plenty of space to play with. Um, so I say, why are we, because what we do in the process of hydroponic is this. We do it in the seating room and we transplant into a nursery channel. There are 72 holes, okay? And then we, after seating room is two weeks, in the nursery channel on the nursery table is another week, and then we transplant out to our regular tables. So at that time when I first started, I was like, well, why, what's the point of transferring to a nursery and then you transfer it back again in one week? Um, it's kind of time wasting, it's about labor and costs. Our minimum wage in a couple of years is gonna be $15 an hour. <laughs> so we, I gotta make, look at efficiencies and la uh, um, labor hours. So anyway, so I decided, hey, how, why don't we cut this process out and then go straight into the 80 ten, 18 channel um, uh, 18 whole channels and what I found out is that um, it's weird the plants they love to be together so it actually grew a lot slower I did a yeah because I separate them that I don't know what they're talking to each other they love each other or something as you can tell you know in this whole room this whole conference I talked to many many different people and they have awesome knowledge about farming I have I'm I gotta say, I'm trying to run a business in a way where I'm not as knowledgeable in farming, but I find the right people to work with me uh, in order to do so. Because I can't be out there, you know, being at farmers markets or doing the deliveries and, and, and that, like, like he's, like Rob, Robert says, yeah, I don't wanna be in that. I mean, if we wanna run a business, you gotta concentrate on certain things and that's why I deter from. So we did, 
better germination in the seeding room. We changed the way, we, we, how many holes we have in the channels. Uh, we even try to find crops that can grow in the 72 uh, channels. So the wasabi aruga that I found, I mean, it grows in 72. I can harvest them like two or three weeks earlier. And they sell like an herb. And this is where I found uh, uh, the quick margin turnaround on that. For me, it always comes back to time. I answer everything with time. It's all, my, that's always going to be my answer. But specifically for yield, it comes down to one, do you have enough time to focus on it? Do you have enough time to hyper-focus on what the plant needs in order to produce more? Or are you stretching yourself too thin? So one is allowing to have yourself enough time to focus on the crop, learn it, research it, study it, look into new varieties. Second part of time comes down to what I'm sure all of you have experienced at some point growing a long season vegetable like tomatoes, is that you plant the crop, it starts producing, and then you have this abundance of a beautiful crop, and it usually lasts about four weeks before you start seeing production kind of go down. You're waiting on the green ones, to, the green cherries to start ripening up, and you're kind of at like, you see your yield start to go down and back up and down and back up if you track those sorts of things. So what we aim to do is plant, even though it can be very hard to do, is to plant these things sequentially. So even a tomato, which will produce the entire season for us and we can plant once and be done, what we do is after we start to see that yield go down, we move past that planting and we start harvesting from a new planting. So for tomatoes, next year we'll do four plantings. One before our last frost date under vented plastic row cover. We'll do one on the normal planting date for our area one a month after that, and one one month after that again, because the fall season, it, you get these frosts pretty late in the fall, but generally your plants are tired, they're getting reduced daylight, and you're just sitting there looking at a green tomato that you've been waiting and waiting and waiting to ripen. It's just back to time. You don't have the time to wait on that if you want to keep your yields up. So we move on to a new, fresh planting of crops. Right into it, and, and even in their answers, I'm seeing everybody's like uh, weighing that yield and that productivity in, the, in how they made those uh, decisions to go forward. You know, do I, do I hold on to those last tomatoes and squeeze out those last, um, you know, the, the last lower yielding crops, or do I move on and, uh, and value my time and move on? So we're gonna just uh, go a little, a short answer about um, uh, other things around the productivity and making yourself more efficient, then we're going to try to leave a little bit of time for some for some um, uh, questions from the from the attendees. So, in terms of productivity, for me again, I'm a one woman show, so I kind of have a personal ethos. It's don't touch it twice. So I I don't like it's easy to go well let me just set this right down here real quick and move on to the next task it's you no know, you really have to complete that task put it where it needs to be because you don't have time to touch it twice they say like you if you don't have time to do it right you'll have to make time to do it over um and i guess the other piece for that to me is um like organizational layout um i have i'm i'm growing in a quarter of an acre for the cut flowers very intensively and so tools are where I need them because I spent my first season walking across the farm you know you do that once you do that twice and before at the end of the day you have spent an hour and a half just walking and not getting much done so don't tw touch it twice and then organize your your work your workspace as well as when you pack for market everything's in there for a very specific reason because it comes out in a certain order as well so So, so I got into farming because I want to also get out of the cubicle. Um, I was in accounting for 10 years, and I, I really thought, you know, growing produce would be an awesome thing, and being outdoors. Um, starting a business, um, in the first couple months, I, I was down there, you know, working the farm and understanding hydroponic. Even just after a couple months, I'm, I'm staring at the computer. So um, I had to hire people. I had to make sure that, you know, so my most important asset for my farm is the employees. And that's the biggest thing if you want to go up to the next level. That, that is productivity. If you have to 
tell them what to do all the time, you'll never get this farm going. You have to learn what they want. What is it that they want in your farm? You gotta make sure they feel important. So for me right now, I'm in a little different stage where I'm trying to learn how to um, work with the team, how to make sure that I'm here right now in this conference and they're not just sitting you know, on the side of the benches just chit-chatting or talking or you know, taking their time. But uh, again, we do like bonus structures, we do um, sales bonuses and so forth. So we, we are looking at numbers a lot. And that's how I uh, do encouragements. And if they did something wrong, we got to make sure is what, what happened and never just do blames, but understanding what, what is the true cost behind it and to work with our employees to uh, go to that next level. Um, if we want to grow a business, we want to do it right, you got to have employees. Um, you can't do everything yourself. Eventually, at first I, was, I had what, six employees. Now it's up to 11. So I got to slowly figure out how to manage the right people. And when you get them to do what they want, they want to do it, that's a whole nother level. Now you're able to come to conferences, meet different people, and able to get out of your farm and understand what's next. Um, never be stagnant in your farm, always thinking what's next. Um, so, this. Easy answer, time. Uh, <laughs> The Japanese have a, a term, muda, and that means wasted time, doing something that you're doing repetitively. So the biggest uh, time suck really comes to the pack house. Uh, what can you do there to save as much time as possible? Taking even one step to get to the stickers that you're putting on the boxes, that's wasted time. Move them closer to you. Uh, you can look at things like produce a better crop so that you don't have as much time sorting. Grow crack-resistant cherries so you're not sorting them out in the pack house easy solution, requires no money, just requires a, a switch from one variety to the next. Uh, as Endeavor said, labor. Uh, this year we've participated in the H-2A program for the first time and having dedicated agriculturists come and work on the farm for the entire season to live with us, to work with us side by side was a game changer and our productivity increased exponentially. Uh, we really couldn't be where we're at in the wholesale market without those guys. Forever grateful for that program. And yeah. And the other big thing is weeds. Keep the weeds out of the field and you'll find that your, uh, your flow goes much faster, much easier, because those weeds impact you from harvest to pack house uh, all the way through. Control them when they're little. Every day you let them go, you're losing weeks of labor. Boy, uh, thank you guys, uh, the panelists, for getting through those questions so we can get some uh, questions from all of you. Uh, Dana? Well, I do uh, exclusively to farmers markets. I have some studio and home-based florists. I will tell you, I can't tell you my exact numbers because I'm not done yet, um, but it has exceeded everything I've done on alpacas. And it took me, well, I'm still working towards profitability on the alpaca side because I had con some considerable capital investments, but I already covered all of my costs in the first year and a half on that, so it was, absolutely well worth it for me to expand to cut flowers. Yes. So, question for Robert. Um, I deal with a lot of growers in the southeast, in the region, kind of, and I don't think people understand weeds until they experience <laughs> weeds in the southeast. Oh my God, yeah. um, and so, I, I just have a quick question. If you could go over, because I know with greens, field harvested greens, weeds will very quickly. Pig weeds. Grass. So what is your weed control technique for field harvested crops like that? Sure, it's ever evolving, uh, but our primary method of weed control is we did a lot of experiments with planting density. So the goal is to get the crop in the ground and to get it up, irrigated immediately after planting. And you want to, if Sunlight can't get to the soil, weed seeds can't germinate. So choke them out. Uh, that's the easiest thing. We spend very little time going back through and hand weeding anything. Um, 
it, it can be very different also based on where you're at. I know Michael would tell you very different things. I think he did a Willis type cultivation, very shallow in order to control weeds. That doesn't work where I'm at because of my soil type. It's not sandy enough. Um, so there's, it really depends on your area, but specifically for your area, it's gonna be uh, choking those out so that they can't even germinate, getting the crop up fast enough, especially for salad greens. Uh, for cherry tomatoes, we do plastic, and then we actually just mow the walkways because we wanna keep some grass there because we're a gap audited farm. Uh, so food safety is very high on our list. We don't want that soil splashing back anywhere. So we cover every bit of the soil we can. Moving forward, uh, we want to try to do some no-till things. We're going to try some large-scale tarping projects. There's been a lot of success with that. Canada's done a lot of research with it. It's very promising. I had a few things to that. Um, tarping. Tarping, is, it's just big pieces of recycled plastic that basically sterilize the weed seeds using intense heat. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, a couple things we did on large scale salad greens, the, the primary, th our primary uh, weed control was something we called pre-irrigation, which was you pre prepare the field once at the beginning of the year, and we had the access to irrigation in California because you can't really farm without it. And, uh, but we would water after that just enough for the weeds to come up and then work the ground up very shallowly so you're not bringing up weeds from lower but you're killing that first generation of weeds and try to do that at least once. If you, if you don't have irrigation, you know, um, every time it rains, let, let those weeds come up a little bit and then disc again. If you get a chance to disc a couple times before your plant, you're gonna, do, you're gonna get rid of a lot, you know, let those weeds germinate and get rid of them while they're young and do that a few times. Ellen? Yeah, um, we started this year using this back to Eden where you have wood chips. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mulch, yeah, like a, 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 yeah. And that worked, it's supposed to work really well for what we need because it's a community garden and it holds some moisture in. It's supposed to keep the weeds away. Unfortunately, we had so much rain that it held too much water in. Uh-huh. Actually, for the first time, used uh, a living mulch, which is half wood chips, half compost, and it kind of fixes all of that problem that you're going to have with that. Uh, wood chips alone can also alter the pH pretty significantly, yeah, which right. changes the uptake of different nutrients. That's really hard because you never know what your season's gonna have. So for us, we actually tend to overplant by 25 to 50%, and that's because we just don't ever wanna leave the market. Uh, and also if you're in a CSA program where people have paid by the week, you don't really wanna have a week where you don't have something. So um, yeah, overproduce and donate it to somebody who needs it. Oh, initial crop planning, how much? Well, there's a lot of trial and error for your specific region, but there are several handbooks out there that will tell you like what you need, what your goal should be in terms of production. Like for salad greens, I'm not gonna be happy unless I'm getting a minimum of a half pound per square foot. Uh, so I know exactly what I wanna do, and if it's not meeting that, I need to make a change. Uh, there's a book, Michael, do you remember the book that it's the grower, vegetable grower handbook? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought one and it's, it's, up, it's at the, um, the drawing thing they call them up. The drawing. The extension office. So, uh, yeah, the extension office, that's an excellent resource. There's a, a few people here I bought them for, so that, if, if, if you're uh, getting into the vegetables, uh, write me in. Do you still have one on PDF? Yes, we do have one on PDF. I know that's where I got mine. Yeah, but I just had to live with one on my uh, on the uh, dashboard of my pickup, my home. <laughs>
so I think it's a lot easier to get it <coughs> around with one drive. Uh, that's, that's, that's super great, great idea, Chris. Right I got uh, one here and then one over there. And great questions, by the way. This is fantastic. So I'm, I'm a farmer, but I also have a full-time off-farm income, uh, like a regular nine-to-five job. So that is my husband, and he's a three-year-old. So we are very strapped for time. And we're at this inflection point where we want to figure out what steps we need to take so we can put more time into the farm. And it sounds like all three of you have gone through that experience. And I'm just curious, did you set any specific targets for yourself? What strategies did you take to figure out how long it was going to take you to transition from that full-time off farm income to working on the farm full time? Great question. I've got one real quick on that. For me, the, so the uh, 2018, I did cut flowers for market the first time I was still working part time. I got to September, right before frost, I still had a full four weeks of market left and I was exhausted. And I had to stop marketing because I just physically just, I mean, it, I was burnt. That right there told me, I mean, it wasn't like a financial or a, I mean, I had, I had sales to go along with that to say that this is worth my time. But the, the major thing kind of, it was just one of those oh, moments where you're like, I can't do this like this anymore, um, where I knew I was leaving money on the table because I wasn't fully dedicated. Mine was a little less existential. I'm very much numbers. Uh, so we sat down and we budgeted out exactly what do we need to the penny to survive a year. Uh, we added 20% to that in case of uh, whatever happens. Um, and we quit one at a time. Um, once we were at that point, uh, we developed the market. We just put in the time, put in the effort, developed the market and made sure that our income was where it needed to be and just sequentially quit our jobs. Again, uh, my, my is also numbers. Uh, I basically calculate what I need it for the year. Um, I was actually the only sole income for my family. Uh, at the time, we had two kids. And, you know, so there's a lot of risk involved, but we're, what other people is telling me is always use other people's money. <laughs> anyway. now, I'm not saying to borrow your friends or anything like that. Find, find people that believe in you that has extra cash as an investor, want to get a good return. You can, there's all sorts of way to work a partnership. Um, even you know, when my is my partnership, I, uh, what we did was that I would never own the land, but I'm able to buy 50% into the business. But in paper, you can say I'm the 51% in profit sharing. You can start with zero and start slowly buying into the business. So that's the best um, advice: is use other people's money, do that investment, and get that starting. If you know, if you can already calculate. There's an income source. I mean, for us, we buy into a pre-existing business, so we look at all their financial, understand the details. Um, like I say, I'm still wrong. You know, whatever you do, if if you go into the business, still, you know, whatever you think you're gonna make, you know, minus 40% of that. You know, it's just that's why I say times 60. So, and then you figure that number out and see if that will work for your family. It is a leap of faith. Still, you still have to make that decision to go or not. Um, but again, starting small is the best. And understanding how the crop you know, changes throughout the whole year is very important. Understanding how that will work and understanding where your market is. You know, eventually, everyone in here can grow the best product. But it's where you found that market is very important to you first. And then before you dive in full on, it's the best time to learn and to find that market right away before you do it. Child care, if you got, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's um, you know, half the farmers in the United States uh, maintain a day job, you know, there's the, uh, and if you're interested, um, if, if you're in this position where you need to maintain a day job, uh, um, one way to get into vegetables is what I call like a single crop you know, farming is the classic is uh, grow a, a pumpkin patch for, or a, a corn maze or uh, grow a, um, 
um, sweet corn and you know the old uh, days of uh, somebody selling uh, picking their sweet corn on the on the weekend and selling it at the roadside stand and, and having uh, uh, several succession plans of sweet corn and it's easier to keep control of the weeds it's less, less labor intensive you can pick it everybody loves fresh sweet corn something like that so I, I had a question over here from the marine I get a lot of my seeds from Johnny's um, and Glockner. Um, and yes, I have a walk-in cooler. I have a four by eight. That It's very small, but it's perfect for me. My market is on Saturday. So I start cutting typically for market. Um, like Tuesday, it depends on the crop because some will hold a lot longer in the cooler. And, and I will cut up until Thursday evening and then I wrap on Friday for early Saturday market. So for us in the produce side, we do also have a cooler. Um, we actually use this regular air conditioner, but use a cool bot. It was the best thing ever that, you know, I just had to replace it the week before I came here. <laughs> and after six years of using it. Um, what's your other question? You seeds? So I also use Johnny Select, but I do have a, a vendor that's supply all the Asian seeds for all California. Um, I, I can tell you that um, I know the name, but I need to get the number and everything for you. If anyone else need it, please just text me. I'll text them the information. I almost exclusively use Johnny Seeds. I've tried just about everybody out there, and I always come back to them. thought about it, but I'm already kind of stretched in what I'm already offering. And typically, I'm cutting things before they get pollinated. I'm cutting mine more closed. Um, but I am leaving. I have some beds where I let them just kind of go, because I have found that that actually helps me with ladybugs for the next year. So um, yeah, I haven't done bees, but sounds cool. I'm indoors. <laughs> we, we still probably ask, but uh, I'm going to answer that question a little differently. Um, two weeks ago, I went down to Ensenada with my distributor that you know I usually sell my Asian greens to. Um, he drives a brand new Mercedes, and uh, when he's down there, thousand dollars is like nothing to him, and I, that gets me thinking. Um, I'm here laboring, you know, we're trying to make single digit margins and what's going on. So in, in turn, how to answer your question is, I feel like when you go to, let's say you go to the farm market, you just started, there's plenty of other grower that grow really good quality product. Once you have the sales channel, you work with them, you, now you'd be able to provide more different products. That cuts your time in, you know, in labor of doing everything at once. Concentrate on what you're getting at, good at and find another source. Don't always thinking you can do it all because we can't. Yeah, so that's my advice. Easy answer, time. <laughs> do you have the time to develop the markets for it if they're not already there? Are the markets staring in your face and you can just walk into them? I mean, we keep bees too. Nothing needs to be pollinated by bees on our farm. They're all self-pollinating, but do you really have time? And it's easy to really start to stretch yourself thin. And if you do go into all these different markets, um, can you focus on it enough to make it profitable? How much profit can you actually make from it if you're only giving it a tiny fraction of your time? Speaking of time, we 
got five minutes, so I got one question over here. Yeah, yeah. was that you? Yeah, I've been raising my hand, but I had a question for Endeavor. Do you, you mentioned that you wanted to buy some land. Um, do you find that the hydroponic is is very expensive to grow? Is it a would it be viable basically in a place besides California as far as where land might be it definitely would be more viable besides California. <laughs> the land is, is very expensive there, but um, I've been working on ideas for about three years now. I think give me two more years, I really have a really good complete package that I want to share with people that want to get into farming. I did calculation and understanding the market. I'm testing it out right now um, to see how that will work. But in hydroponic, in other areas where it's hard, like getting fresh produce all the way from the California coast to the East Coast or to the middle. I mean, it, I seen lettuce price way up there. For us down there, there's lettuce grower all over the place. You gotta figure out a niche, you gotta figure out different products. For my customer, I sell to a, um, a school district that has 28 schools, we're able to connect that, so they take majority of that product. But hydroponic, you gotta, don't go out and buy a you know, $150,000 crop king high, you know, fancy stuff. I'm, I'm telling you, you know, with hunt, high tunnel, with some fans and water wall, you can get a really cheap start and, you know, do some testing on Dutch Bucket and FT. I, I think it's profitable, as long as you're doing your math. For me, it's math. Right, yeah, yeah I was thinking that's different. You can fertilize the water. Yeah, I, yeah my, the conventional way of growing is super easy. It's not hard at all. But right now, when you want to open the market to uh, become organic, that's where they're, that's where I'm going to next is trying to figure out organic hydroponic. Uh, they authorize you to get uh, approval for hydroponic uh, for organics. Uh, agriculturists. It's the H2A program. Uh, it's the migrant farm laborer. Um, it's a Department of Labor program. Uh, now is the time to apply for it if you want anyone for next season. I think the deadline's December 15th if you want them in time for the growing season. Uh, but you, it's basically just a program in order to go to Mexico at whatever part you want to if you know someone or you can just take whoever uh, and you bring those guys up to the to your farm for a, a contracted season. So it is kind of important to make sure you're at a place where you're going to make the money to pay them because it is a contract. And you sponsor their visa, is that? Yes, uh, you sponsor their visa. It is like your name on there. Mm -hmm.